Let's start off right now by grabbing your Bible and turning to the Gospel of John. And if you don't have a Bible, a really cool invitation that I want to give you is just to raise your hand and let one of my friends know that, hey, I'd like a Bible. They're going to bring you a Bible, and that Bible is actually a gift from Reach Church to you. We want everybody to have the Bible in their hand. We are going to be in our I Am series as we pick up week two, where we left off last week, and we are looking at seven teachings, seven unique teachings that Jesus gives that help us understand the person, the purpose, and the passions of Jesus. It's hard to believe, but we actually started studying the book of John, the gospel of John, back in May. We started with a series that we called Signs, where we looked at the seven miracles that John records in his gospel that Jesus performed, which gave evidence for the person, the purpose, and the passion of Jesus. Then we spent seven weeks in a series called Critical Conversations, where we looked at John's recording of how Jesus had these incredibly critical conversations with people, again, bringing about the person, purpose, and passions of Jesus. Last week, we started a series on seven teachings of Jesus, which he, in his own words, through I am statements, gives us clarity on who he is, what he cares about, and what we are called to. And I'm excited today as we tackle week two, light of the world. John chapter 8 is where we're going to spend a majority of our time together today. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to go with my family and some friends of ours to go fishing. While we were out fishing, my five-year-old got bored pretty quickly along with our friend's five-year-old and they made their way over to a gazebo and grabbed my wife's phone and started watching videos together while we were out slaying bass and crappie and bluegill. All of a sudden, I heard my five-year-old scream, an irrational fear-filled scream. And I looked over and she couldn't even articulate all the way what she was afraid of. And it happened more than once. Once was because of a bee that didn't even land on her, but was by her. But she just recently was stung for the first time in her life. And so she has a crazy fear of bees now because of the pain. I ran over to find out why my daughter was screaming. And she pointed and said, there's a snake. I looked over, and I am telling you, where I come from in Oregon, we have garter snakes. They're common snakes, but they're about a foot long and about an inch in diameter total. There's nothing to be afraid of. The snakes here in Nebraska, this, and I, this is not a hyperbole. I'm not, I'm not embellishing to make this story sound bigger than it was. That thing was three feet long and at least three inches in diameter. It was huge, and it had all kinds of colors on it, and this one red mark, which apparently is pretty distinctive to let you know that it's, it's nothing to be afraid of. Well, I thought, okay, in my mind, I know that this snake can't hurt. I'm six foot one, for Pete's sake, 215 pounds. I've wrestled my entire life. There's no way that this snake is going to do anything to me. It feeds on mice and on crickets and whatever else they feed on. I think I'm going to show my daughter there's nothing to be afraid of. So I walk over to this snake that is now starting to make its way out of the area because of my daughter's blood-curdling scream. I reach down to grab the tail of this snake to pick it up to show her that there's nothing to be afraid of. As soon as I touch the tail's the, the snake's tail, it turned around, popped its head up at me, and took off. I did what any God-fearing rational man would do. <laughs> I made the same noise that my five-year-old made. <laughs> I jumped back in absolute fear. So I have a friend with me, and my friend was in law enforcement for six years and grew up in a community where they had copperheads around them, and they would have to fish and, and have to navigate through copperheads, and my friend's not afraid of snakes. He starts digging through the, the grassy area in this, in this gazebo, doing this kind of like the, 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 what I should have done, the manly thing, and he was going to throw the snake away so it didn't get near the kids. And as he's digging through it, he's like, hey, can you help me find this? I start looking over, and all of a sudden, my friend has his hands in the grass, and he comes up at me like this. <laughs> and as he did, I fell over... <laughs> My wife began chest compressions. His wife grabbed the AED. I freaked out in irrational fear. I jumped back. I put my fists up in the air as though I was going to fight this snake. I was 
man, I was panicked. It's, it, 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 it's, it's irrational. It doesn't even make sense that I should be afraid of something that's three feet long and two inches in diameter. But I'm telling you, the snakes in Nebraska, there's nothing good about the good life in Nebraska when it comes to snakes. The only, the only good snake is just like the only good cat. None. Oh, I'm a dog person. I'm a dog person. So I was thinking about fears. I pulled up several articles from Psychology Today and USA Today and one in particular, Anxiety House Today. I read a list of the top phobias of 2020 and they're growing and they're changing. So you might be familiar with some of these. You might be surprised by some of these. Check this out. Number 10. How many of you can agree with this? The fear of germs, misophobia, the fear of germs. Obviously, that's a growing fear amongst COVID-19. People even being irrational in some instances with how they're approaching germs. Number nine, the fear of flying. I'm not even going to attempt to say how it's pronounced in, in clinician terms, but how many of you are afraid of flying, in particular turbulence, when all of a sudden the plane, I, I found out what turbulence was, by the way. You think it's just air pushing against the airplane? No, 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 no. Turbulence is when the, air, when, when the airplane hits a pocket of air and drops feet. All of a sudden it's steady at 30,000 feet and it drops down to 29,997 feet. It dropped three feet, but it felt like the whole plane just, oh, I hate turbulence. Number eight, the fear of social situations. Anybody get that? You get afraid of social situations, social anxiety? Number seven, the fear of needles. You don't want injections. You're afraid of needles. You see that thing coming and you, you, you freak out. Number six, the fear of thunder and lightning is a big one. Number five, the fear of dogs. Number four, claustrophobia, the fear of confined spaces, being stuck in a confined space where you can't escape, you can't leave. Number three, this is also a very rational fear, the fear of heights. I've seen enough uh, parkour videos gone wrong that I have a healthy fear of heights. Uh, number two, which is what I just talked about, the fear of snakes. Number one fear, arachnophobia, fear of spiders. Fear of spiders. They actually, in this article, broke down the categories of fear by state. The number one fear consistent through the state of Nebraska is the fear of spiders. I don't know what it is. Spiders don't freak me out. I can literally go up to a spider, grab it by the legs, and it, they don't bug me. A snake, on the other hand, forget it. Pastor Steve Doolin, you can't miss him. He's wearing the lime green Bobby Wagner jersey as he came in this morning. and probably sounded like this. Good morning! As you came in, that fool is afraid of uh, uh, spiders. He said to me this morning, as we were talking about this, he said, man, if you ever came at me with a spider after I came to from passing out, I'd kill you. I'd fill your whole office full of snakes. I, it wouldn't be good. He has an irrational fear of spiders. How many know that the fastest growing fear in 2020, even amongst adults, and this might surprise you, the fastest growing fear even amongst adults, is the fear of darkness. In fact, in the UK, 40% of adults polled said that they had a fear of darkness. And 17% of that 40 sleep with the nightlight. 17% of the adults in the United Kingdom sleep with the nightlight because they have a fear of the darkness. And it's not just the lights out. It's not just darkness. It's what happens in the dark. It's what we are unaware of in the dark. It's the same noises that we'll hear during the daytime, but they sound different during the nighttime because we can't see them. A lot of times these fears are irrational, but we, we associate darkness with doom, with dread, with uncertainty, with things that we can't see. We feel, we feel unprepared in the dark. We don't know if there's someone lurking or looming around a corner or under a bed or in a closet. If you're afraid of dark, I'm probably not doing you any favors right now. The fastest growing fear amongst adults right now is the fear of dark. And I think it has to do with control. And when we can't see what's in front of us, we feel like we're out of control. And none of us likes to feel like we're out of control. Well, today, in week two of our I Am series, we're going to look at, we're going to look at darkness, and we're going to look at what Jesus says, not only about darkness, but who he is in the darkness, as we pick up in week two 
a message entitled Light of the World. As we jump into the scriptures, let's start in prayer. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for Reach Church. God, I love this place. I love these people. I love this community. And I love you. And I thank you that you've gifted me this opportunity to share your word this morning. Lord, I pray that your voice would be heard loud and clear. I pray that I would rightly divide your word today with authenticity and accuracy and in a way that matters and makes sense. God, I pray that each one of us would adopt what we hear and we would live it out. I pray that you would meet us where we're at. I pray against distractions today. Help us to focus and to lean into what you want to speak to us. We invite your presence, Holy Spirit, to come and move and have your being here among us. And I pray now that the words of my mouth and that the meditations of our hearts would be received as a gift, holy and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, so what we're going to do is the primary focus for today's message is going to actually be John chapter 8, verses 12 through 20, which is where we see the second of the seven teachings of Jesus. I am, I am the light of the world. But before that, to help us with some culture and context, because the more we understand culture and context, the better able we are to understand and apply the word of God to our lives. I want to read what's happening. I want us to collectively set the backdrop for what we're about to study together today. So we're going to start in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Follow along with me in your Bibles, John chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, a story that is familiar to many of us. It reads, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down, and he taught them. As he was speaking, the teacher of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to Stoner, what do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus, I would encourage you to highlight that or circle that or underline that. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. And so he stood up again and he said, all right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down, and again he wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again, and he said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. On the eighth day of the festival of shelters, where countless people have made a pilgrimage to the holy city of Jerusalem to be at the temple for this celebration, Jesus gets alone to the Mount of Olives, which is just across the Kidron Valley to the east of the temple. It's within walking distance and clear eyesight. You can see this limestone mountainside covered with olive groves. Jesus is there. He goes to the Mount of Olives. It's one of the most primary points of geography in the the Bible, specifically in the New Testament. Some amazing things happen there. This is where Jesus will give the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This is where Jesus will look out over Jerusalem and he will weep for brokenness for Jerusalem. This is where Jesus will go and he will have his final statement, his final conversation with the disciples when he says, look, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, and then he is, ascends to the heavens. This is a significant hallmark for the Christian life. Jesus is often alone in this area, this region, this mountainside, also the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus would cry out in agony, leading up to his arrest, takes place there. But we see multiple times throughout Scripture that Jesus chooses Mount Olivet, or the Mount of Olives, to go and to be alone with the Father, to recharge and to pray, to realign himself with the Father, with the will of the Father. He'll say over and over and over again, and you're going to see it today as we study John 8, 12 through 20, Jesus will continually point to the will of the Father. As Jesus is there, 
He wakes up early the next morning and he heads back toward the temple in Jerusalem along with countless other God-fearing Jews on the eighth day, the final day of this celebration, the festival of shelters. Why? Because it's tradition and customary. It's actually a mandate by God that they will go to the temple or they will go to the synagogues three times a day in collective prayer and worship together, 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and 3 p.m. As Jesus enters Jerusalem, there are several layers, we'll call them layers, there are several distinctive areas between the temple gate and the Holy of Holies. One of the first areas that everyone can walk into is the the court of the Gentiles, and just past the court of the Gentiles is the court of women. In the court of women, where Gentiles weren't even allowed, but the women could gather, there are four areas that are pretty distinctive. One of those is the temple treasury, where there are 13 collection boxes where people would come with their offerings, with their tithe, with their gifts for the priest and for God and for the community and for the kingdom. Jesus is teaching in the temple of women where there's a massive audience that has gathered around for collective time of prayer and worship. And as Jesus is teaching and there's this collective audience, there is a group of religious zealots. These are far right extremists who come in with the woman who is either A, naked, or B, if they're being generous, is clothed in the same bedding that she was caught in the act of adultery. Now let's talk about that for a minute. Being caught in the act of anything meant that you were a first-hand eyewitness to what was taking place. Now we don't know because the Bible doesn't give specifics about how this woman was caught or who she was caught with, but we can come to some conclusions based on the fact that the Bible tells us she was caught in the act of adultery. To be committing adultery was to be intimate with someone who was not your spouse. To be caught means that more than two people, two or more, had to see the act with their own eyes. They would have busted in on the act, snatched this woman up, and drug her back into Jerusalem, back to the temple where Jesus was seated with his disciples around him and who knows how many others listening to Jesus teach. These religious leaders would have drugged this woman, humility and nakedness and all, to the center stage of the social justice system. They would have cast this woman in front of Jesus And with a big, grandiose display of pious righteousness, would have asked Jesus, the law of Moses tells us in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, there's 613 laws, there are 365 prohibitions and 248 mandates that these Pharisees and scribes are are required to, to know and to uphold and to hold others accountable to. Coming before Jesus and all these in the audience, they cast this woman out and they they read the charges against her. According to the law of Moses, the Bible says that an individual caught in the act of adultery like this must be stoned to death. What do you say, teacher? Now, they're not acknowledging Jesus as their teacher. There were a lot of teachers in this community. What they do acknowledge is that Jesus has a following and an audience, that they consider him to be their rabbi, their teacher, but the Pharisees do not. They're angry with Jesus. They're conflicted about his message. It is actually in in direct conflict to everything that they have ever known to be true in their own lives. And rather than... in, 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 in enlarge their territory intellectually and relationally, they, they, they go on the offense, they go on the attack, and they're looking for ways to catch Jesus. Now, by bringing this woman in front of everybody, this very public audience, they're hoping that one of three things will happen. One, Jesus will ignore it and look like he shows no grace. Two, that Jesus will extend grace, which is in direct conflict with the law of Moses, which would have been considered blasphemy, or three, that Jesus would have actually committed a crime. A Jewish individual caught in a crime had a process. We see it when Paul is imprisoned and he doesn't get to go through the proper appointment of of trials. And so they're hoping that Jesus will condemn this woman in front of everyone, and now he will be guilty of committing an illegal act. But Jesus... But Jesus, but Jesus, two of the most profound, important words throughout the entire Bible. In the midst of moments where we're caught 
in life's transgressions. In the midst of those moments where the scenario that we're faced with is bigger than we could have ever imagined and we are uncomfortable at best, clearly unqualified to navigate where we are facing something that is so much larger than us. And each one of us can identify with a moment, maybe not a moment where you've been drug out naked through the streets and tossed in front of a, loud, a large audience, but every one of us can identify with a moment that was so overwhelming and beyond our control. Maybe perhaps you were given a medical diagnosis that you didn't expect and it was bigger than anything you could ever imagine. Maybe it's financial, perhaps it's relational, or maybe, just maybe, the consequences of your own doings have caught up to you and you're now facing the, the, the ramifications of that choice. And it looks like life as you know it is crumbling all around you. Imagine, just imagine if you will, this woman who wore the scarlet letter, this woman who was drug out in all of her indecencies, not just physically, but the act of sexual d depravity and she's put out in front of the court of public opinion and everyone gets to weigh in on this. And, and they know that legally, the ramifications for something like this was to physically, what they would do is they would take her just outside of the city where there would have been a, 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 a cistern almost dug out of the ground, a large pothole, if you will. They would have thrown this woman into that pothole and the collective community would have gathered together and they would have each picked up stones and one by one, one after the other, would have hurled thro these stones at her and pelting her would have eventually killed her. The trauma, the blunt force trauma of each one of these stones by the entire community. This is what the woman was faced with. The obstacles in front of her were insurmountable. But Jesus... How many of you, if you're honest right now, need a but Jesus moment? You're facing something that is far larger than you could have ever imagined you would be faced with. But Jesus, Jesus shows up and Jesus rescues and Jesus restores. Jesus recreates, he regenerates. We see this in verse 11. After asking this woman, where are your accusers? Has no one stayed to condemn you? Jesus in his infinite wisdom, his supernatural grace, his radical love, his unsurmounted compassion will kneel and he'll write in the ground. And what he writes is really inconsequential to what he does. And he'll ask a question that each one of us needs to wrestle through. Okay, but any of you who are perfect, any of you who've never sinned, go ahead and throw the first stone. And why is this so critical? Because in the court of public opinion, an affair is drastically different than maybe fudging a little bit on our taxes. A, a, a woman caught in the act of adultery is a little bit different than somebody who just got a speeding ticket. But they know these religious leaders, they're well aware that the Bible is clear, God is clear that all sin separates us from God. Paul will remind the church in Rome in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He'll go on to remind the church in Rome in Romans 6.23, for the wages of that sin is death. But Jesus, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, how many of you feel like you're facing an insurmountable obstacle right in front of you right now? Financial, I don't know what it is. You could literally put a blank line here and every one of us, if not now, at some point will be able to fill out whatever it is that we need a miracle for. And I want to encourage you this morning, a little sermonette before the sermon, but Jesus, make room for Jesus to move in this moment. Make room for Jesus to move in your marriage. Make room for Jesus to move in your business. Make room for Jesus to move in your relationships. Make room for Jesus to move in your fears. But Jesus, Jesus restores this woman to new life. He says, has anybody condemned you? She says, no, sir, not any of them. And he says, then I don't either. Go and sin no more. It's not enough to, 
to just know that Jesus offers new life, but we are called to live out that new life. It's called regeneration through repentance. Repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is acknowledging that you've done wrong, accepting responsibility for that wrong, apologizing for the wrong, and literally abandoning the action that was wrong in favor of Jesus, in favor of his miracle working power. But Jesus... That might be the word that somebody needed this morning. And if that is, praise God. But Jesus. This is the backdrop that we see. This is the cultural landscape. This is the geographical picture that we see as we pick up in verse 12 this morning. Verse 12, beginning to read verse by verse now. It says in verse 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Can you you just envision with me for a moment this woman who's been put on public trial, Jesus radically shows up and then he responds as though nothing happened. Okay, so as I was saying, we were all about to stone this woman for her, for her egregious behaviors. But, but what I was saying before the religious leaders brought her in was, Jesus literally picks up where he left off and carries on the conversation. But I want us to understand culturally and contextually that the conversation now carries new meaning, new weight, new significance. Jesus is brilliant. None of us would argue that. If you're here this morning and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus as your Savior, I I think you would agree that Jesus, at the very least, was a brilliant educator, a brilliant teacher, a man that did pretty crazy things. And that's what people are facing in this context is uh, not all of them. In fact, many probably have not surrendered to Jesus as their Savior. They don't even know that the Messiah is in front of them. They're still looking for the Messiah. They've got all the pre-qualifiers that they have in their own minds of what the Savior is going to look like, what the Messiah is going to look like, how he's going to show up clothed in purple and riding on this majestic horse with, a, with an army in front and an army in the back with trumpets blaring, this, this royalty, this king that is going to come through and he's going to restore Israel. And yet Jesus doesn't come like that at all, yet he conquers all of it. So Jesus picks up where he left off, but the tone, the temperature in the room shifts dramatically. And Jesus, as he he continues teaching, he says, Jesus spoke once more to the people and he said, I am the light of the world. Oh, there are so many cultural references here that we can't miss. But let's start with the most obvious in front of us. Can we admit right now that if someone is caught in the act of adultery, that is dark? Can we admit right now that if if your sins, and I want you to make it personal, if your sins were literally put on display for the world to see, that might be the darkest hour of your life. Can we admit that That what has just happened, this this infidelity, this brokenness, is a situation of absolute and utter darkness and despair. So Jesus, in a brilliant contrast, greater than any oil or water illustration will ever do, takes the setting and the backdrop of total darkness and he introduces the concept of light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Let's continue with some of the visual illustrations that Jesus is is painting here. They're here on the final day of the Festival of Shelters. There are three things, if you remember from a few weeks ago when we taught through this in a critical conversation, there are three things that take place in the Festival of Shelters every day as part of this ceremony. The first is every morning as the individuals collectively rise as a community, they're going to turn to the West and they're going to pray to God toward the West. This is an, an act of defiance for their for their ancestors who followed the pagan god of the sun and prayed to the east as the sun rose every morning. The second thing that they would do is what we know as water libation where with the priest in tow, they would all go down to the pool of Siloam, the pool of scent. They would watch the priest dip this golden 
this golden bowl in the pool of Siloam and collectively they would follow and they would chant and they would sing and they would praise and they would pray as the priest would go back up to the altar and would pour out the water on the altar. But the third, the third and one of the most critical points to today's conversation was the, was the festival of lights. You see, God led the Israelites through the desert for almost 40 years with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire or light by night. They associated light with leadership. They, they, there was a direct parallel between light and life. And so as Jesus now says, I am the light of the world, he's dealing with a situation that was absolute darkness, but he's also going to play to their intellectual understanding of the light, that God is light. That God's light gives us leadership. That God's light brings us to life. We've talked about in this series before that in Exodus 3, we see as Moses encounters God on the side of the mountain, he asks God this question, who should I tell him has sent me? When he's referring to his own people, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, and Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And what does God say? He says, you tell him, I am that I am. They are very well aware of this. And so this is a radical statement. When, when Jesus says, I am, he is literally saying to them, parse it out, break it up. He is saying that he and the Father are one. He is saying, I am the one that I am. I am God. And now he says, I am the light of the world. What does the light of the world have to do with anything? Culturally, they didn't have the Edison bulb that they could just turn on. They relied entirely on cloth and oil to keep a lantern burning. And the individual who, in a caravan, was out front would lead with the lantern. But at any point, if the, if the lamp lost its oil and the light went dim, in the wilderness, it was a very deadly thing. You had marauders, robbers, murderers who were waiting to attack, but you also had to deal with wildlife. Wildlife safari that would come and attack them. The other danger is if you got separated from the leader of the pack and you were ill-prepared and you didn't have any light, you were left to wander the wilderness on your own and you can't see a lot of times what you're stepping into or where you're stepping in and sometimes it can be really innocent my, my son Caden is 17 years old when he was five years old 12 years ago we we lived in North Carolina in North Carolina I was a pastor of a church out there one of the pastors out there I was college young adult high school new junior high pastor and we had a student of mine from a former church fly into Raleigh which was two hours away from where we lived in New Bern and we drove to pick him up Chase and I were very close. He was close to our family. As we were coming back, my son had to use the bathroom. It was about 11 o'clock at night. He really, really, really had to go to the bathroom. There was a two-hour stretch of highway between Raleigh and New Bern, and there was not a lot of places to stop. And so in haste, knowing that he had to pee really, 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 really bad, we stopped on the side of the freeway. And as we got out, Caden stepped out of the car. And as he started to go to the bathroom, I heard this unbelievable screaming and crying. And I could and see what he was crying about. I don't, I don't know what was going on at that moment. And so I grabbed my son, and as I do, there, there weren't light flashlights on phones at that time, so the only light that I had was inside my car. I grabbed my son, and I brought him inside the car to find out what was going on. And I am not exaggerating even a little bit. From his nipples down, he was covered in fire ants. Covered. Chase and I began to try to knock these fire ants off of my son, stripping him naked to get him out from underneath his clothes. I dial 911. I was close. They said, how fast can you drive? And I said, that's a good question. I'm about to find out. They were worried about anaphylactic shock. And so they said, you need to get here as soon as you can because we can send out an ambulance. But the truth is you'll probably get here before we get to you. When we got to the hospital, the doctor, the nurses, they counted with us over 120 bites. You know how they treated it? Oatmeal bath and yellow mustard. Good thing I took him to the emergency room. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make here is because we didn't have any light, 
we had no direction. And because we had no direction, we didn't know where we were stepping. And what happened was my son stepped into something that was incredibly painful and could have been deadly. If he was allergic at all, he would have gone into anaphylactic shock. His, his airways would have closed up and that would have been the end of our son's life. This is the danger that the Israelites are facing by getting separated from the leader of the pack where there is no light. So Jesus then says, I am the light of the world. He is saying, I am God and I am the one who's going to lead you and I am the one who gives life. He is saying this on the heels of a situation that's completely dark. He is saying this on the heels of a celebration where they use light as a part of the, 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 the praise and the, the worship and the celebration, the remembering God's direction. Now look at this. He said, I, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, I need all of us to pay close attention to this. If you follow me denotes that we have what? A choice. I could ask you right now, if you think the, the New England Patriots are going to win today, or if you think that the Seattle Seahawks are going to win today, and I'm going to hear more, more feedback from you about football, then listen to me. What I just said is, when we read this here, and he says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, what does that suggest? That we have a choice. You won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Jesus comes before us and he presents himself as the light of the world. Today we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not only in us, but he reminds us that he is around us and wants to work through us. And that when we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have the light of the world at work in us. But here's the thing. We have a choice in the matter. Regardless of what you've ever been taught or told, I promise you, I could spend hours taking us through scripture after scripture after scripture and helping us to understand and identify that though God presents himself, though Jesus has sacrificed himself, though we have this unbelievable, beautiful life-saving miracle of, 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 of salvation that is presented to us, we have to respond to that. And this morning, what I need you to know is even if you're walking in darkness right now, two things. Number one, you don't have to. Number two, you do have to invite Jesus to move. But Jesus. If you're walking in darkness this morning, you're not going to want to hear me say this to you, but it's a choice. Your circumstance may not be the choice. Your surroundings may not be the choice. But how you navigate what you're up against, how you and I navigate what we're faced with, that is a choice. We can chase after pop culture solutions, pop psychology, every podcast, every blog, every personal opinion, every social media outlet, or we can turn our affections and our attentions to Jesus who is the light of the world and he can lead us. He gives us that choice. He says, I am the light of the world. Now look at the excitement that the Pharisees have. The Pharisees replied, you're making those claims about yourself. In other words, in front of an entire massive audience, they say, you're lying. You're a liar. Why were they so combative? Because it flies in the face of everything that they knew to be true. And it, and it, and it contradicted the way they had lived their lives. Even in religious circles, we don't often leave room for the Holy Spirit when it doesn't fit our personal preferences. Such testimony isn't valid. And Jesus told him, these claims are valid even though I make them about myself. For I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you, you don't know this about me. You judge me by human standards, but I don't judge anyone. And if I did, my judgment would be correct in every respect because I am not alone. The Father who sent me is with me. Your own law says, Leviticus 20.10, your own law says that if two people agree about something, their witness is accepted as fact. I am one witness and my Father who sent me is the other. Now what he's referring to here is an ancient prophecy. I want you to hold your finger here in John 8 and I want you to turn right smack dab in the middle of your Bible to the old prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 8. Jesus says, you don't know this about me because you don't know my father. You don't know I care for him. You don't even see what's in front of me. But my father is a witness. My father is a testimony. My father knows this about me. What is he referring to? Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. 
I'll give you a second to get there. When you get there, just shout out with a big, fat, huge amen. 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 All right, that's enough amens to get going. Isaiah 8, beginning in verse 11. This is the prophet Isaiah to the nation of Israel. Here's what he says. The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does, he said. Don't call everything a conspiracy like they do. How many, how many of you know that preach is really good right now? All right. And don't live in dread of what frightens them. How many of you know we don't need to live in fear right now? Make the, when I got into reading this prophecy, I literally thought, Lord, how am I going to get through this without preaching a third sermon? Because I knew that the sermonette was going to be John 8, 1 through 11. And, and then as we got into 12 through 20, but then I got into this, I'm like, Lord, you are, you are really pushing me this week. My, 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 my staff gives me about 40-ish minutes to preach, and I got three sermons to give. Well, let's just keep going. Verse 13, make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. Man, church, highlight the heck out of that. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. It's a choice. It doesn't just happen. He is the one you should fear. He is the one you should make tremble. He will keep you safe. But to Israel and Judah, he will be a stone that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many will stumble and fall, never to rise again. They will be snared and captured. Verse, 13, or verse 16, preserve the teaching of God. Entrust his instructions to those who follow me. I will wait for the Lord who has turned away from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my hope in him. I am, I and the children that the Lord has given me serve as signs and warnings to Israel from the Lord of heaven's armies who dwells in the temple of Mount Zion. Someone may say to you, let's, let's ask the mediums and those who consult the spirits of the dead with their whisperings and mutterings. They will tell us what to do. But shouldn't people ask God for guidance? Can I get an amen? Should the living seek guidance from the dead? Look to God's instructions and teachings. Listen, I'm going to take a minute to talk about politics. I am not going to talk to you about the right or the left, the red or the blue. I am not going to talk to you about who to vote for. Here's what I will tell you. Don't vote a party line. Vote scripture. Let the teachings of God instruct you. Let the teachings of God inform you. Let the teachings of God influence you. Let the teachings of God be the authority. And how do you know what the teachings of God are? Because every week when you come here, we say, pull out your Bible. Here we go. Someone may say to you, let's ask a medium. Should let the living see the verse 20. Look to God's instructions and teachings. People who contradict his word are completely in the what? The dark. They will go from one place to another, weary and hungry. And because they are hungry, they will rage and curse their king and their God. They will look up to heaven and down at the earth. But wherever they look, there will be trouble and anguish and dark despair. They will be thrown out into the darkness. Do you notice how darkness over and over again is referred to in the context of death? Nevertheless, that time of darkness, verse 1, chapter 9, and despair will not go on forever. Amen. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with the glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Praise God. Centuries before Jesus is in the temple treasury teaching in the court of the women to these people on the heels of a very, very, very bleak, dark situa situation, God knew that he was going to come in the form of Jesus and he was going to be the light of the world. And now here, when the Pharisees say, you can't say that about you. You don't get to testify. You need more witnesses. Jesus says, oh, you do know there's another witness. It was already witnessed. It was already prophesied. It was already promised. You, you, you're forgetting the, the, the own head knowledge that you, you claim to hold on to. Verse 19, look at this. Verse 19, John chapter 8, verse 19. John chapter 8, verse 19. Here's the Pharisees' response. Where is your father, they asked. And Jesus answered, since you don't know who I am, you don't know who my father is. And if you knew me, you would also know my father. Jesus made these statements while he was teaching in the section of the temple known as the treasury, but he was not arrested because of his time. It had not yet come. Church. John points out in his gospel account of Jesus' person, 
person, person, and his purpose, and his passion. That where Jesus was teaching and what he was talking about was no mistake. Everyone there was aware of the dangers of living in darkness. And they felt the fears that are intrinsic with darkness. And even their own head knowledge didn't serve them because they were not willing to see the light that was in front of them. Let me wrap up this way. As Jesus is teaching in the court of women to the southeast of the temple is the temple treasury. Jesus using this beautiful backdrop where four large lanterns, each containing four golden bowls, each filled with oil from an olive and priestly garments that had been recycled. Jesus' backdrop is the most brilliant light you would have seen at that time. Think about that imagery, the light that is shining and the gold that it is reflecting off of. The purpose is a reminder for all the nation of Israel and others at large. As they're coming to pray, they see that light and they remember that God is life, that God will lead them. Jesus, in the midst of the darkness, uses this illustration, this celebration as a reminder that even in the midst of whatever darkness you're living in, there is an opportunity for the light of life to pierce the darkness. Now, I want us to understand just a little bit what that must have felt like. So for just a moment, I want to warn you parents with children and those of you who are a part of the 40% growing in the UK that are afraid of the dark, we are going to turn out the lights just for a moment. Go ahead. Most of you are comfortable right now because you know at least somewhat who's sitting around you. You can see the exit lights, but if this is how you had to walk around all the time and you had no leadership in your life and you had no light to pierce the darkness, the truth is we would stumble and we would fall and there is a potential for unbelievable death. But I want us to understand what but Jesus looks like, but Jesus. Jesus, his life is a light that pierces the darkness. And this one flashlight that I am holding in my hand is enough to illuminate this entire room. And if I were to tell you in the midst of chaos, and an emergency, and in the absolute darkness of whatever the circumstance, to follow me, you would be able to follow me, and you would be able to follow me confidently because of the light. I could give direction to anywhere we want to go. I could show us. I could shine the light in any direction. And go ahead and turn the lights on, please. So let me ask you then, if you have a choice to live in darkness or live in light, why would you ever choose to try to make your way through life in darkness? Jesus is the light of the world and he offers himself up to be the leader of your life and to be the life giver. But Jesus, friends, my challenge to us this morning As Jesus tells us again about his purpose, his presence, his purpose, his passion, the person of Jesus, we get to choose. We get to choose Jesus. The band is going to come out right now and we're going to worship together collectively. We're going to sing and we're going to praise God. But I pray that each and every one of us this morning will stop and give sober consideration to what Jesus being the light of our lives looks like. Because here's the promise. 
If Jesus is the light of our lives, we cannot live in darkness. The Bible says, Paul says to the church in Corinth, what do light and darkness have in common? What do life and death have in common? Literally nothing. If we have Jesus living and in us and through us as the light of the world, it will change every behavior. We will modify our behaviors around Jesus and his leadership in our lives. Can I put it to you very soberly? Can I put it to you very practically? Very, very present tense. If Jesus is the light of the world, you don't have to worry about the elections in November. And by the way, I've read this cover to cover. America is not mentioned in here one time as a sovereign nation. Those of us who are more focused on what's going to happen in our nation have lost sight of eternity. I don't want my kids worrying about whether it's going to be Trump or Biden. I want them worried about their eternity and where we're going to rest forever. Can, can I just say that when Jesus is the light of your life, there's no room for darkness. That light will cast out the darkness of pornography. That light will cast out. I have a friend on staff who says, man, I used to struggle with pornography. And then all of a sudden, a friend of mine said, look, anytime you struggle with pornography, just text me the word Jesus and just keep saying the name Jesus over and over again and see if you can do it. See if you can look at pornography. He's like, dude, ruin, change my life. Ruin, ruin my habit, change my life for the better. Imagine if we allowed Jesus to be the light of our lives when it comes to alcohol consumption, when it comes to the way we spend our time, when it comes to the way we spend our money, when it comes to the way we talk to people, when it comes to the way that we tolerate people, when it comes to the way we, 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 we approach the way we think about life and how we live our lives. Jesus, but Jesus, there's hope in Jesus.